16 years ago, when I was a young researcher, I met a 10-year-old Haitian-American girl named Ata Bay, who first introduced me to the importance of cross-race friendships in young children and how complex, precious, and rare these friendships are and why they matter to the development of all children. Ata Bay was given the title of peacemaker by her fourth grade classmates. To be a peacemaker, she said, one needed to be able to make friends across different racial identity groups. Something, she said, was really difficult to do. She cited stereotypes and prejudice often getting in the way and noted that teachers neither noticed nor intervened when children experienced discrimination. Yet, she herself had two intimate and close friendships of four years, one with a Vietnamese-American friend and one with a white friend. Years later, immersed in interracial friendship research by then, I met another child, another fourth grader, Devon, an African-American boy. He explained to me that when you have friends of all different backgrounds, you learn all kinds of different things. And you learn that everyone thinks differently. And you begin to think differently, too. In other words, what I learned from Devon is that children in cross-race friendships practice taking multiple perspectives or multiple perspectivity. Research spanning decades reveals that multiple perspectivity is connected to the development of critical thinking. And research on interracial friendships connects it to prejudice reduction, positive racial attitudes, increased cultural competence, increased empathy, increased social skills, and decreased outgroup anxiety. A myriad of benefits. But Devon wasn't aware of this research at the age of 10. He spoke from his lived experience, and his wisdom didn't end there. Consider what he had to say about children who don't have cross-race friendships. He predicted that children who don't cross racial barriers in their friendships would be, quote, stuck repeating the same things over and over again, playing the same games, hanging out with the same kids, talking about the same things, and I quote, for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Another thing that Devon noticed is that interracial friendships were a little more difficult and a little bit more challenging to begin because you had to be able to at least initially do things that felt unfamiliar and uncomfortable. In fact, research on interracial friendships demonstrate that these relationships are less prevalent than same-race friendships and that they only decrease as children get older for the very reasons that Devon cites. If we are white, we are no more likely to have mixed race friendships today than our parents and grandparents did decades ago. In 2013, the Pew's Research Center American Values Survey found that 75% of white adults have entirely white social networks without no people of color within them, not one. So where would our children learn to cross boundaries of race? Every year, I ask students, both undergraduate and graduate students, who are preparing to work with young people in school and community settings, 
to take a self-interview assignment. And among the many questions that they answer are questions about their own friendship circles, as well as questions about the experiences of students across social identity groups, and questions to assess their knowledge about systems of injustice, questions about racism, sexism, heterosexism, transphobia, and ableism. Consider Rachel's responses on several of these questions. All of my friends are white. They all look like me. They're white, middle class, and straight. I grew up in a bubble, and now I go to college in a bubble. I hate to admit it, but I don't know how other people live. I am not into politics or current events. I have no idea about the experiences of students of color, LGBTQ students, or students with disabilities. Rachel was honest in answering her self-interview assignment and connected her experience growing up in a racially and economically segregated community to her insular upbringing and her lack of knowledge about students different from herself. Yet, these students that she knows nothing about are the students she hopes to work with in two years' time upon her graduation. So this lack of cultural and social political knowledge, then, is rather problematic. So let's go back to what Devon said. Devon predicted that students who didn't cross boundaries of race, who didn't go outside of their own racial identity groups, would be stuck for the rest of their lives, perhaps staying in their bubbles, as Rachel would say. Now, while I certainly hope this isn't the case, we have no reason to doubt Devon's prediction if we look to our own social networks, if we look to adults' friendship circles. Our lives are indeed segregated and racially homogeneous. Those are indeed our life trajectories. Neighborhoods are racially segregated. Daycare centers are racially segregated. And according to the UCLA Civil Rights Projects, schools nationwide are on average more racially segregated today than they were in the 1960s. And these are the contexts in which our children make and grow their friendships. When you consider that friendships are the places where children learn about the world around them, where they learn how to perceive about themselves and the world around them, when they learn how to practice intimacy, affection, and companionship, this segregation has important implications. And if 75% of white adults have entirely white social networks and rarely have interracial friendships, consider the implications on youth of color. How do white young people interact in the rare interracial spaces that there are? Even in interracial friendships, well-meaning white young people often don't understand the impact of racism on their own friends of color. I want to tell you the story of Asha. Asha describes herself as a girl of color. She's a fourth grader. She's a girl of Haitian and Venezuelan descent. In the first grade, she had an interaction with her close white friend, which left her devastated and crying in the arms of her mother. They were on the playground, playing and talking, and Asha began telling her friend a story 
about black men being harmed and killed by police. Her white friend listened and at the end of the story said, no, that's not true, that can't be true. Despite Asha's insistence that, no, it is true. Black men are in fact killed by police. That night, Asha's mother, also a woman of color and a social justice educator, explained to Asha that many white young children don't know about racism, about police brutality, about Black Lives Matter, because many white parents don't feel comfortable talking to young children about these issues. Indeed, many white parents don't feel comfortable talking to young children about color, race, or racism. We believe that children of four, five, and six years of age haven't even noticed race yet. Of course, this couldn't be farther from the truth. Research conducted with preschoolers reveals conclusively that young children, both children of color and white children, not only understand the concept of race, they understand the social status assigned to different racial groups. In 2010, CNN commissioned renowned psychologist and University of Chicago professor, Dr. Margaret Beale Spencer, to conduct a study on children's racial awareness and perceptions of race. The study tested four and five-year-old children as well as nine and 10-year-old children. Children were shown pictures of children on a color scale from white to black with various shades of brown in between. And children were asked to respond to certain prompts. For example, show me the smart child. Show me the dumb child. Show me the child that most adults like. Show me the child that most adults don't like. What the research revealed is that children have overwhelmingly white biased responses, meaning that they have positive perceptions of white children and negative perceptions of black and brown children. 76% of four and five year old white children responded by choosing the two darkest children on the color scale, and 76% of children responded by choosing those two darkest children when they answered the question, show me the dumb child and show me the mean child. 66% of children chose the darkest child on the color scale when answering the question, show me the child that most children don't like. What this means is that as white people, we must unlearn the myth that children are colorblind and that they're not ready to have conversations about color, race, and racism. If we feel unprepared, uncomfortable, ignorant, we must engage in the plethora of resources out there to become ready to engage in these important conversations because not to do so has dire consequences. Dr. Beverly Tatum who is a psychologist and author of the seminal book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, explains that for youth of color, intergroup interactions are not only uncomfortable, 
they're possibly harmful, both because of unconscious bias, but also because they happen in the context of institutional inequity. So intergroup interactions, therefore, have to be supported both with these difficult conversations and by creating opportunities to work on prejudice reduction and promoting equity in the social settings in which they occur, mainly schools. So what are these conditions for prejudice reduction? First, young people have to experience equal status in the context in which intergroup interactions happen. Secondly, we have to provide opportunities for young people to work on common goals in the context of collaborative experiences. And lastly, young people must experience the support of authorities, teachers, administrators, and the adults in their lives. Now, given that these are the optimal conditions that have been identified in research on prejudice reduction and intergroup friendships, we have both a problem and a challenge, something to work towards. We are falling short of accomplishing these optimal conditions. In schools across the nation, and right here locally, in our own district, students of color are disproportionately disciplined. And when they're disciplined, they receive harsher punishments than their white counterparts. Students of color are overrepresented in lower academic tracks. They're less likely to be identified for gifted and talented programs, even when scoring similarly on standardized test measures than their white classmates. They're less likely to be in honors and advanced placement classes. They're more likely to be taught by less experienced, white, middle-class, monolingual teachers who lack professional development on issues of implicit racial bias. And students of color are less likely to be taught by veteran and master teachers. And when they are, those teachers, along with building administrators and <laughs> district administrators, are highly unlikely to be people of color. Missing from the curricula are protagonists of color in the books that all students read. And while white students' literature, history, and culture are represented in the core curriculum, students of color's literature, history, and culture are often relegated in occasional cultural heritage initiatives of the month or diversity days. So equal status doesn't exist. Opportunities to work on common goals in the context of collaborative experiences don't exist either because students' lives are effectively segregated and tracked within the school. This is systemic inequity. Academic tracking by race and class, disciplining disparities by race and class, curricular misrepresentation or lack of representation. This educational picture sends a clear portrait and a clear message to students, both students of color and white students, about their position, status, and power, both in school and in society at large. This context of inequity matters. It is a moral imperative to fix this.
And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have solutions, right? Some schools are experimenting with detracking. In other schools, there's restructuring going on. There's creative thinking about reorganization. How can our most experienced veteran master teachers teach the students who need most support? What a novel and interesting <laughs> idea, right? In schools that are committed to social justice, restorative justice practices are replacing punitive disciplinary models. And social justice curricula exists, and it exists for young people, right? It can be adopted in preschool so that young children are talking about color, race, identity, and inclusion. And administrators can be engaged in serious and meaningful conversation about racial bias in all aspects of education, including educational leadership and hiring practices that make it nearly impossible for administrators of color to permeate predominantly white districts. The obstacles to cross-race friendships are many, pervasive and systemic. But it doesn't have to be this way. In these divisive times of racist, xenophobic, anti-immigration speeches, of calls to build walls, Muslim bans, of rhetoric that would divide us, we need more peacemakers like Atabe. And while there are children who can navigate these difficult, this difficult terrain on their own, children like Atabe and Devon, we need more adults to stand up and step in to help, to create equitable schools where deep and meaningful relationships can happen, where young people can connect, where children and adult, adults can care for one another. Because we must learn, we must internalize and understand that our well-being is indeed in being connected to one another. Thank you.